Good morning, uh, Ms. McLeod, Brigadier General Bernier, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Uh, thank you very much for having me speak here today. Um, I'm going to talk about a journey that I've been on, and um, I'm going to talk about it in a way that hopefully will help others in terms of the lived experience that I've gone through. Um, as a forensic psychiatrist, you have an opportunity to see lots of gory things, uh, lots of uh, post-mortem pictures, lots of blood and gush, uh, increasingly in color, and on and on and on. And you hear horrible stories. And having been at that for a long period of time, uh, I realized that none of that really did much to me in the sense of affecting me as an individual. I think also as a forensic psychiatrist, you are trained to disregard what people have done as part of the process of evaluation to make sure that you can try and understand the person, their motivations, and things like that. However, I was exposed to, uh, first of all, um, when I evaluated Mr. Bernardo, and uh, this started a journey which has certainly been interesting and certainly caused me some difficulties, but also in a lot of ways has uh, made me realize a lot of things about myself and certainly a lot of things about PTSD. Um, what had happened initially was that on September the 7th, 2010, I received a court order to uh, conduct a forensic psychiatric evaluation on Colonel Russell Williams. Um, typically, with this type of evaluation, what happens is that you have a 30-day window uh, you have to work extremely hard, you've got to avoid the media. So what I would do would work my regular day and then around about 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock at night start to do the forensic evaluation of Colonel Williams at the Royal Ottawa Mental Health Centre and work through till midnight or 1 a.m. Um, the expectation from the court in these high-profile cases are, is quite pressured, you have to get the work done and certainly in the, in the in this particular case, there were not of, a lot of things that were and still are not in the public domain that required a lot of work. So it was a stressful um, issue for me, and it was not dissimilar to what had happened some years previously, about 15 years previously, when I evaluated Paul Bernardo. And what happened then was, uh, to make a long story short, I was originally retained by the Crown and then released to work with the defense. And in particular, as you know, there was a series of videotapes that came to the awareness of the legal community at a time after Colm Hamalka had worked out a deal. And I was then put in a position where I went to Toronto, I picked up the videotapes and came back to Ottawa and then spent a long time studying them. Um, and I even viewed, had a look at them in the, uh, in the presence of Mr. Bernardo. What happened to me after that was really quite significant. There were particular parts of the videotape that started to play in my mind. Um, they played in my mind with the scene. Uh, it created a, an emotional disturbance for me. Um, although I didn't realize it at the time, I had uh, some other reasons why I would be more sensitive to this type of thing. And uh, for about a, a period of about three months, it was there. It was very intense in the beginning, um, difficult to fall asleep at night. It was bothering me before I fell asleep, but it faded with time. So within about three to six months or so, this had uh, gone away, although there was particular scenes in the videotape that was sensitive to me. And if I ever had to talk about uh, the Bernardo case, I always got a little bit queasy when I started to, to talk about it. Um, the issue with uh, Colonel Williams was a little bit different in the sense of uh, what happened with me. I went through this evaluation, um, and then just before the 30 days were up, I went to Aurelia, the Ontario Provincial Police Headquarters to view the videotapes there. And uh, I sat in a room with a, a, um, a member of the Ontario Provincial Police, and I went through the videotapes. I went through them quite quickly. 
Uh, I didn't look through every detail and uh, found them, to say the least, quite disturbing. And uh, then I left there, got into my car, and within about, I guess about half an hour, and it's roughly a five and a half hour trip from Aurelia back to Ottawa, um, I started to feel very, very disturbed. In fact, I started to cry uncontrollably. Um, it was the best way to describe it was an emotional storm. I wasn't sure what was going on. In many ways, I thought I was going crazy, quote. And this went on, off and on. I pulled over the side of the road. I didn't really help too much. And uh, I drove back to Ottawa slowly, and this didn't go away. In fact, it, it was there. There were some bizarre aspects to it as well. I felt that my life was a failure, that everything, my whole career had been a waste of time. And, uh, you know, and, and I knew at a certain intellectual level this wasn't uh, really the, the, the complete uh, truth, but, but I was believing it at that time. And then there was particular parts of the videotape that were again started to play in my head. Um, it started to play in my head, not only the, the video itself, but the sound associated with it. Um, and uh, what I was started to do was then I would, uh, I would avoid going to sleep at night. I, I don't sleep much anyway, which has been great for productivity from a research and academic point of view. But when you're not sleeping much anyway and you stay awake because the worst time is as you're falling asleep for... Um, the videotapes to play in my head, I found I was getting less and less sleep, more and more distressed, and um, everything seemed to be more and more problematic. Um, there was then a situation where what happened was I, um, and it was all sort of packed into this, there was, I'd been involved in a, another case for the Crown, it was a dangerous offender case, about 26 hours of videotape, a lot of it was pretty awful, but not as bad as some of the things that I'd seen. And I got a phone call from the Crown who wanted me to go over these videotapes, and I became very upset about it, angry about it, uh, went to testify, and my examination chief went actually very well. And then, uh, and there was an issue about videotapes at that time. This was about a person who was unconscious when there were sort of some pretty uh, horrible sexual acts that were performed, but there was some evidence she may have consented before this actually happened, and there was a Supreme Court of Canada case that gave some uh, legal authority to that particular opinion. And it, um, So when I was being cross-examined, the defense counsel sort of got up and he seemed to ask me the same questions over and over again. And for somebody like myself that has been cross-examined many times, this wasn't the most onerous cross-examination but I found that I became completely irritated and I started to think in my mind that this guy was an effing a-hole and, uh, and it just sort of got in my mind to the point that there was a point there when I nearly blurted it out in court and then I realized you know, that would have been professionally problematic to say the least. Um, anyway, I, I went back, uh, got back to, to Ottawa that was also out of town and I realized I need to, needed to get help and uh, I went and went to the Ontario Medical Association Physician Help Program. Um, the lady in charge of the program used to be a resident and trained with me in, in, in Ottawa, so it was kind of a personal experience, but in some ways it was a little bit dif different as well. Um, George Fraser, who is a um, Canadian expert in PTSD, I ended up seeing George. He diagnosed me as having PTSD. And off I went and I was referred to somebody in Toronto who also had been a student of mine some years before. And I can be fairly persuasive, so what happened, and of course doctors are bad patients to begin with, and uh, so I went to see this particular person who said I had PTSD, recommended a course of treatment. I said, nah, I don't need this, you know, I'm sort of kind of a tough guy, it's fine, I don't need it. And uh, I'll come back and see you in a couple of months. And I was still struggling at that time. And over the next year, I got much worse. I became incre increasingly depressed. Um, I don't drink much. When I used to drink, I would fall asleep. It used to be a joke. I'd leave the dinner table when we had guests to, uh, to go out of the room, and then I'd fall asleep, and the guests would be home, go home. And uh, you know, I was sleeping. But uh, I found now, if I drank, I became much more irritable, much more emotional, much more difficult. 
somewhere in there, I developed uh, a supraventricular tachycardia and had a heart attack, which was completely out of character for me. I, I don't smoke, I don't I work out a lot and things like that, so there was all kinds of things going on. And as I slid down this, this pathway, there was a point where I was extremely depressed. Um, I was separated from my wife for a period of time, and I became actually suicidal in the sense that uh, I just spent a weekend with my daughter in Montreal, came back home, felt very alone, and I remember looking, about, uh, looking at the staircase about where I was gonna hang myself, and as a physician, I was gonna make sure I was gonna do it properly, and I worked it all out. And I was thinking about it, and the phone went. And it was a, a friend of ours who never phones me, and completely out of the blue, and uh, was worried about me for no real reason, because I hadn't really told anybody about this. And, uh, and then, uh, about an hour or so after that, uh, and that helped a bit, and then my daughter phoned me, and um, that then became a turning point where I then went and got, uh, I got treatment. And um, honest, when, I, when I actually engaged in treatment, both uh, cognitive behavioral treatment, desensitization, and medication, it made an enormous difference. And since that time, things have improved for me dramatically. I continue on medication. I'm actually on medication at the moment. Um, I put myself back on medication if I feel that I'm slipping. And um, since that time, I've realized uh, a number of things. First of all, I didn't think you could be, uh, develop PTSD by being exposed only to videos. I now know from talking to judges and others and lawyers and many other people that this is a serious problem, has to be taken seriously. So for example, we're looking at uh, uh, exposing jurors, for example, in the Magnata trial to videotapes. These are ordinary people that go there to do their civic duty, whereas in fact you may be traumatizing them. Um, I now know, and I'm in a panel in a couple of weeks' time, where a number of judges who have, uh, have, are required to look at the, all the evidence, including this videotape evidence, um, have had themselves been struggling and had developed symptoms of PTSD. So um, just to end off very, very briefly, I think we live in a world, it's a digital world, where um, anybody can buy a high definition digital camera on the corner, record all kinds of things in both uh, graphic video and also high definition sound that I think with certain people with vulnerabilities, myself included, can cause some serious difficulties, and I think we need to be very sensitive to that. So thanks for listening, and I'll be quite happy to answer any questions later on.